Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about unmanned underwater vehicles. So let's dive right into it. Now, why do we have need for such a thing? Reality is majority of our infrastructure is slowly going underwater and they are expanding more and more. So meaning back in the old days, we barely had like 100 kilometer wire. Now we have thousands and thousands of kilometers of undersea wires, which are very important. And because of the high value into them, regular inspection is the key. Meaning these things are important and precious to a nation and to economy, to everything attached to it. So inspection has to be done as regularly as possible to make sure, well, you don't have oops days so it is very serious thing now undersea fiber uh, connection is one of the most important thing from our data communication point of view then we also have power now like who the hell will transmit power well you can't transmit ac power for long distance as late. you have to utilize what we call hvdc high voltage direct current links and they can be also be done in such a way that you only need one cable one monopole transmission and these are generally used uh, around europe to communicate uh, you know connect to two nations uh, you know if going through a river or going through sea uh, and these are also very important they are transmitting hundreds of megawatts of power so they are also very important then you have gas um, i am pretty sure most of you understand the importance of gas and oil pipeline also so these things are what we classify as high priority for everyone involved you cannot live in a nation where you have oops entire nation's fiber um, connection went down simply because somebody snipped it underwater so it is one of those things that need of it is growing exponentially and i'm not even going to touch into uh, you know offshore wind farms because we barely had like few turbines now we have hundreds and hundreds of turbines which all require maintenance so it is growing industry in terms of requirement of it so what are the problems that we are facing the problem is right now at this point in time majority of things are still relying on divers now divers do their job again that's how we built our modern infrastructure but they are very expensive from a cost point of view and they are slow meaning how much work they can do even if you have like a whole team working on it they are not that fast and it puts human life at risk nobody wants to do with that nobody wants to risk a human unless absolutely necessary but like right now that's the only way you can do under sea welding and like you know pipe maintenance and things of that nature so it is not enough at this point in time. We have a fleet of uh, divers who are taking care of well every nation's infrastructure, but they are not enough because, simply because our infrastructure is expanding faster than they can expand. So basically there is over demand and supply is very limited. So, and that's just the infrastructure side of thing. War is also a very critical aspect because submarines are limited by the crew. So if you can remove the crew and you have a nuclear submarine, what you can actually do is horrifyingly powerful. So that's the problem of it. So how do you design something like this? Well, it's rather simple. It's just take a submarine, miniaturize it. And you have a lot of design freedom simply because when you are designing things around a human, you have to take into consideration human itself, basically. How the heck human is going to remain cool? How the heck, uh, you know, uh, how much air pressure has to be there? All those things uh, create an issue. When you do not have to worry about those things, you can just let it go. So you have a lot more design freedom. Does not matter whether you're making something small or something idiotically huge. You have a lot of design freedom in basically how do you have component layout? How do you design it to be accessible? All those things. And they have still have the same limits as full size submarine. Limit wise, as in like they still have to come up to air if they are diesel electric system. And if they are like, you know, uh, nuclear power, only then they have like true advantage that they actually does not have to come up ever. Uh, ever as in like ever is too much because again, I'm pretty sure their equipments will wear down. So I'm pretty sure they can still stay underwater for like, you know, few months at a time before they have to do data dump to clear out the memory, which uh, is much better than compared to 77 days of generally nuclear submarines. So. Uh, how do they communicate basically this sort of system how do they communicate they because they are non-military meaning it's okay to yell where I am uh, they use acoustic sound waves meaning just audio uh, to transmit uh, you know underwater now thankfully audio travels very far underwater and it can transmit up to 80 bits per second now you may be like wait a minute isn't that ludicrously slow absolutely but the idea is basically recently NOAA started to mandate a system mandate would be incorrect word think of it this way they started a basically protocol where there's like if you have an undersea communication requirement utilize this protocol that protocol is 80 bits per second now why would you need undersea communication protocol because i specified there are so many undersea fiber cable if you have a repeater in undersea fiber cable after after every 100 kilometers you may want to have a repeater there that can be you know read directly there so if you have five six repeaters how do you know which repeater faulted it's very difficult you may think it's super easy now nah? it's very difficult so if you have a submarine literally go on top of each of them and directly wirelessly communicate it's like me green go 
me green not to go then you're like okay this point is the broken one so that is why it's even that 80 bits per second is very important and for many undersea like you know uh, pressure gauges and things of that nature 80 bits per second is more than enough basically if you have an oil line if you have a voltage uh, potential for uh, basically power line all you have to transmit is like green or no green that's a more than enough so there is a lot of communication for that. Now, how do you make sure the electronics just don't go poof? Simply because salt water is corrosive AF. It will destroy anything. So first, uh, if you are very rich, you will make a container shell that can just like you know pro provide a one atmosphere environment. Generally, if you are not that rich, you will use oil filled electronics. Now, benefit of oil filled electronics is super cheap compared to everything else, and it does allow if the components put inside them. Basically, if you have all the capacitors, capacitors have a PSI rating, meaning if you compress them through uh, oil too much, their Capacitance will change if you're lucky and they will short out if you use too much pressure. So there is a limit to that. But if you oil fill it, things that can barely go to 100 meters in depth will easily go to 300 meters. And if you are using components that are specifically designed to handle that kind of PSI, you can easily go to Mariana Trench, like just go as deep as needed. So that's the easiest way to uh, basically prove the electronics. And this also helps in, uh, you know, conducting heat away. So you can have radiator exactly where you need to for more convenient uh, transfer of heat. So that's how you, uh, you know, take care of electronics. And how do you figure out the position? That's the part where it's uh, very tricky because they have to use underwater buoys. Uh, these buoys are like beacon, exactly like how GPS satellites are beacon in space. Here, they are using sonar, uh, basically sound uh, ping they are doing. Now, do submarines use this? Yes, generally, but they disable it the moment a war is triggered simply because it's yelling out like, look at me, look at me. So everybody can just poke this puppies up, but for unmanned system they are good enough so if you are talking about like a maintenance crew that is you know uh, using underwater vehicle every wind farm could literally have uh, one of these buoy that will allow a computer onboard navigation chip to like figure out a virtual space where it's like this is my height this is my altitude longitude everything underwater based on this system so acoustic positioning system is utilized for uh, basic navigation and these are the buoys they utilize for this so that's the design aspect, but it's more or less the same, just you have more design freedom, somebody like literally designed this. So I'm pretty sure this will allow them to at least do a few dives per day and then I'll have to worry about fuel. It's again, it's a slow but very long running device. So first thing we utilized was ROUV, meaning remotely operated uh, underwater vehicle. Now, the reason we can do remotely operated is simply because we utilize a tether. You cannot do a radio communication to the surface. So flat out, they had to have a tether. Now tether, because of the development in optical communication, super easy. Just one or two fiber, you can communicate gigabytes of data very easily. So you can have multiple cameras and all the data can be fed into the uh, system. And it's very low latency, awesome for remote manipulation. And sometimes if it's big, you may even see a cable that is much thicker so it can transmit power also. So utilizing generally DC bus. So they are amazing for maintenance and inspection. So that's their primary use. They started to become very prevalent around around 1990s and they started to become common by early 2000s. So like they are everywhere. So if you see any incident, generally they will be the first equipment to be deployed anywhere in the planet right now. If anything happens and you are seeing underwater footage from it, 99% of chances something like this was utilized as quickly as possible. They lower the cost of diver a lot simply because let's say you have to inspect 50 pylons that are like, you know, under the uh, sea seabed. You can just deploy this and figure out which pylon actually needs attention. And then you can send the diver. So your diver cost goes from like, you know, uh, hundreds of uh, millions of dollars to basically few million. So this is a very easy way to, uh, you know, reduce diver cost. However, it still has limitations simply because it still needs operator. Operators are, again, trained professionals. So you have to charge them and not to mention to optimize use. So you may have a scenario where you have three operators cycling the one equipment because the equipment does not have an inherent limitation. So you can just keep cycling the crew. So that still limits it to somewhat, but again, much better than diver. And this uh, allows divers to only go when it's absolutely needed, exactly where it's needed. It's really efficient in terms of energy saving. Then what we can expect in the future? Well, autonomous drone. Now, autonomous uh, drone will do everything exactly how a submarine does and it will do uh, same thing. Basically, it will surface up to uh, get charged, meaning if it has diesel electric system, it has to come up. And even if it's a nuclear, it still has to come up for data dumps, meaning there is no way in hell you can communicate gigabytes of data underwater. Just physics does not allow it. So you have to come up, communicate, uh, dump the data to the satellites. And you may want to do it for other reasons also, because things, even you design it to the best ability, you still need inspection once in a while. Again, that 
stretch can be much longer let's say a normal submarine may require every uh, surfacing every 77 days the submarine's nuclear power can easily stay for one year but still has to come up one year and i'm pretty sure the hard drives cannot be big enough where it's like you know doing high resolution mapping of the ocean uh, and you know just collecting all the data in the, it's not as big as a server and again data will be outdated if you do not like you know uh, dump it to command center as quickly as possible. So it has to surface for charge and data dumps and it will utilize swarm mode. Now this was uh, first time tested on a large scale for Malaysian airline hunting underwater and uh, hundreds of these sort of drones were starting to deploy it, and all of them started to act together. Now some companies are specialized in system where they have big drones like you can make them as small as you want, you can make them as big as one. So something medium sized one, multiple of them and they were communicating to each other to accurately position against each other and they were using very high resolution sonar now high resolution sonar is generally not preferred simply because they do not allow you to map farther but it does allow you to map very high resolution meaning you can literally identify features as uh, you know one square fit in size so that they are using that and because they were communicating to each other they were much more aware much more uh, thorough about like you know surface area they will not like you know waste sensor data on like oh overlap is too high to you know make sure you do not miss a part like they are very efficient and they can map out hundreds of square kilometer of area very quickly so that allows us to manage much much larger surface area so if you have a scenario where you have let's say hundreds of uh, offshore wind farm you can have a few swarm and they can take care of each other they can just like take care of the whole uh, you know underwater infrastructure and they will only notify you if there is an issue and there are some systems like uh, Kawasaki is developing some systems where it can literally autonomously go down there, inspect a pipeline, study the pipeline and if there is a fault then only it will notify you. Otherwise it can like keep uh, you know notifying everything and it does not need to surface simply because it has an inductively charged system. I have provided the video down below. So it underwater like it never actually needs to surface it can just underwater come and like again but do mindful this docking station has to be moved so there is a boat on top. It still has an operator again it's not remote operating but still operator has to be there. So that's the future. Every country is working on it. Every single country that is smart enough and has an ocean, basically. If you are a landlocked country, then there is no point. But if you have oceans, this is the easiest way to make sure, like, if you have hundreds of square kilometer of area, you can create high resolution map that can be used by your submarine in passive navigation mode. So future is very serious about these things. And everybody who can design this is working on this, including Boeing. So this is serious to business. So this was my presentation on underwater uh, remotely operated sea vehicles hopefully you have liked it learn from it in that case please hit the like button share it amongst your friend that will help me a lot if you didn't like it didn't enjoy it i urge you to press dislike press it twice to show me extra disappointment please leave a comment because i do try to reply to all of them subscribe press the bell icon if you're free and as always thanks for watching